Welcome, welcome everyone to a new informatics, informatics grand, grand rounds at Johns Hopkins uh, University. Um, today I'm joined by Professor Lehman and um, great um, people from friends from University of Maryland. Um, Harold will introduce him and let you know uh, the exciting topic that we have for today. But before we get started with that, I just wanted to share a little bit of information about our definition and exciting courses that we have for this uh, fourth quarter. Um, so in this quarter, we have um, four cl three classes actually, um, one of them being um, taught by Professor Lehman. The title is Health Sciences Informatics, Knowledge Engineering and Decision Support will provide you understanding of the decision support systems in the workflow of health sciences. Um, so a great way to understand decision making processes and what's the role of clinical decision support. A second class is named Natural Language Processing in the Health Sciences, um, taught by my colleagues, Professor Chi and Professor Roshade. Uh, this class, very relevant for today's day on how NLP should be framed and used in um, real issues related to medicine. Um, finally, we have Professor Nagy teaching the class on implementing fast healthcare interoperability resources. Um, very relevant today with uh, confronting uh, many challenging issues that need interoperability between electronic medical record systems across disparate and, and very dissimilar institutions in the US. So with that being said, Harold, uh, now you have the power to introduce our friends. Great, thank you. Uh, so this the, 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 the session is great on a number of uh, accounts. For one thing, uh, um, we as you know, we have the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, uh, our CTSA, Clinical and Translation Science Award installation at Johns Hopkins, and uh, we, uh, we are, we are I, I, in this, in this uh, five-year cycle, we are um, partnering with University of Maryland, and these sessions that we have as grand rounds is part of that uh, of, of that commitment to partnering. So, we're, at at, at that, that very level, we're happy to have the speakers today. And it's a little bit, I think, why we have a a a, um, a a nice bunch of people presenting. You know, it's it's now the twelfth month anniversary of the lockdown for the pandemic, but uh, this talk is a reminder that medicine continues on, unfortunately, and that uh, the COVID is not the only problem we face in medicine. So let me just give a quick introduction then for our speakers. Um, um, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Fadia Shea. A uh, Shaya is a professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Health Services Research at University of Maryland School of Pharmacy and a member of the Maryland FDA Center for Excellence in Regulatory Science. Uh, which is quite a mouthful. She's also the executive director of the Behavioral Health Research and Policy Program and director of the Center on Drugs and Public Policy and an elected member of the Board of Directors of Academy Health. She's in charge of the statewide prescription drug misuse prevention program, which is where this concern about opiates is such a, is such a, a, a big deal. And finally, she is also the, um, the, the uh, head of the informatics core for the Maryland IC, uh, ICTR uh, partner. Um, she has a PhD in, in, uh, in, from the School of Public Health from Johns Hopkins and uh, did her uh, doctoral work in health economics at Sorbonne uh, and uh, has been very productive since then. Uh, Tim Oates is a, a professor of technology at Computer Science Electrical Engineering Department of University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, uh, Tim and I did some work together several years ago with a, a postdoc uh, we had in our department, so I'm glad to have this opportunity to see him again. He received a BS degree in computer science electrical engineering from North Carolina State University in 1989 and an MS and PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 1997-2000. Prior to coming to UMBC, he spent a year as a postdoc at, in AI at, the MS, at MIT uh, and is an author or co-author of more than 200 reviewed papers in the areas such as time series analysis, graph analytics, NLP processes, and medical informatics. These are all areas that are vital 
for the analysis of the data that we're all accumulating uh, uh, these days in clinical informatics. Uh, he's a co-founder and chief data scientist of Data Science Consulting co Company Synaptic AI, served as the interim director of UMBC Masters of Professional Studies in Data Science Program, and serves as the director of, of AI and Cybersecurity Corps at the University of Maryland uh, uh, Baltimore Institute of Clinical and Translational Research, our CTSA partner. And not, last but not least, um, uh, 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 um, uh, Dr. Purva Pradhan is a postdoc research fellow, also in the Pharmaceutical Health Services Research Department at University of Maryland, uh, holds an MD from India with specialization in Ayurveda, uh, the Indian traditional system of medicine, and has an MPH from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Her majors for masters include Epi and Biostat, Health Leadership and Management, Health Economics, and holds a certificate in machine learning from MIT, uh, she was named one of Maryland's Center of Excellence in Regulatory Science Innovation Scholar in 2020 for research project on machine learning and drug and health technology assessments. And you'll hear more about her uh, interests now since I'm taking up too much time. So uh, Dr. Pradhan, please take it away. We would like to acknowledge in this, uh, before we start, uh, certainly uh, Dr. Lehman and colleagues and the ICTR at Hopkins for hosting us. Thank you very much. We would also like to acknowledge the ICTR at the University of Maryland and Dr. Davis and his team and at UMBC as well, uh, as well as our source of support, which is the ATIP grant, as well as the MCERC, the Center on Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation for supporting partly the efforts of uh, Dr. Pradhan uh, in her fellowship. So with this, I would like to get started. Again, thank you for hosting us, and we are delighted to be presenting today on this very important topic. Next slide, please. Uh, we are addressing today uh, a major public health problem, which I would say has been eclipsed a little by the COVID pandemic. However, make no mistake, unfortunately, the opioid overdose events have been increasing. The rate of overdose has been increasing even as all of our attention now has turned to COVID. In addition, we've had other conditions of substance misuse, substance abuse, alcohol binge drinking, and uh, mental health disorders also increasing in incidence and prevalence as we are moving uh, through this pandemic. At this one year anniversary of the pandemic, we thought it would be important to take stock of what happened and more importantly, to leverage some of the new technologies that we have in analyzing data so that we can be active in preempting not only overdoses, but possibly, and we circle to this at the end, uh, possibly the next pandemic. Uh, the opioid epidemic has gravely affected the nation. We often think about it as affecting people between the ages of 18 to 25, but it has also been highly impactful in younger age groups as well as older adults and elderly populations. Next slide, please. Our outline today is to identify the problem, identify the gap in what we're doing, introduce machine learning and artificial intelligence as the new tools to delve through all the data that are accumulating as we speak and make some intelligent connections so that we can help in that overdose uh, prevention. We will show you also the results of some of our analyses, and then we will use these results for uh, discussing the pros and the cons. So why are we talking about this today? It is because our research efforts have really not been systematic in addressing the problem. Next slide, please. This is not for the lack of initiatives. It is not because of the lack of money put behind the problem, but I would argue that our results have been suboptimal. Clearly, when we are constantly noting an increase in the prevalence of overdose events, among most vulnerable populations, we know that we have not really um, done our job yet. So um, we do not, again, have a systematic approach. Now, these 
are projects, interestingly, that we are doing hand in hand with the state. So uh, we do uh, or participate and help local jurisdictions uh, define certain interventions. These might include dispensing naloxone to different initiatives, perhaps to different venues, not only pharmacies with the naloxone standing order, but also first responders, peer-to-peer, -peer, the Good Samaritan law to uh, make sure that people are responding at the point of uh, emergency without fear of uh, punishment, uh, social outreach calls, lock-in programs, referral services. You have heard about the prescription drug monitoring program. We will get back to that. But again, we do not have a systematic approach. And it is time now with the lesson of the pandemic that maybe there are early signs that we can systematically bring into that prescribing interface. So next, please. You might ask, why are you focusing on prescribing? Aren't people getting uh, opioids? Aren't overdoses really caused by uh, prescription drugs that are acquired elsewhere? In fact, they are. We have a national, not national, sorry, statewide survey, it will soon be national, that has asked people uh, where they are procuring opioids. And in fact, most of those opioids are procured through prescriptions that are not for those individuals or non-prescription on the street. Now, it is very important, however, for us as researchers to start with the beginning. The research is showing us that the first point of vulnerability really starts with that very innocuous first prescription. That might be for a tooth extraction in the dentist's office. It might be for a sports injury, or it might be for, for some neuromuscular condition. But all of these start with perhaps a few years back, but they start with a proper prescription to the proper intended patient. But again, we have an absence of standardized method to assess the impact of how that prescription then fast forward becomes a misuse and then of overdose. Uh, we, so next slide, please. So with this background here, our goal is really to develop an algorithm to help inform prescribing decisions at the point of service so that those patients with high risk are identified and that they are properly managed. Currently, with the prescription drug monitoring program, the aim is to reduce prescribing. But there is some concern that that might have a across the board chilling effect on prescribing, such that those who need those medications and perhaps are not such high risk will be denied the opportunity for pain relief through drugs that work, as well as those who are potentially at very high risk of addiction. So it's a very broad stroke that it's uncalled for, especially that we have the tools to tease out those risk signals to inform that prescribing decision at the point of prescribing. Next slide, please. So what did we do? We said, okay, let's go and see how we can use those methods of AI and ML to develop an algorithm that will define and refine and identify that risk profile. We have used a national database, which is the IQVIA Pharmetrics Plus data. It is a validated data set, nationally representative. Now it is administrative data, but it is very comprehensive and it does perhaps date back a few years, but remember the goal of this study for us was to practice and compare those two methods, the AIML to the traditional regression models and see which ones might lend us more precision and more information that can eventually be used at the clinical interface. I do want to remind you, this is an ICTR, Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, and we're very interested in that translation part. At the end of the day, perhaps our results might be a little dated in terms of the impact, but the idea here is to compare those two methods. And this is what we are bringing to this session here to show you the impact that applying those methods 
to a current problem, to an urgent and time sensitive problem, and to a problem that can be to a large extent solved at the clinical interface. So that's the idea. Next slide, please. The next question you might ask, well, you got the data, you have the problem we understand, but why did you focus on IQ via commercial population? Why didn't you address, for example, Medicare? Didn't we, don't we think that uh, Medicare populations are at higher risk after all? They are on more medications, et cetera. Yes, they are. Aren't Medicaid populations also underserved, possibly at higher risk? Yes, they are. But also there, we have a lot of research in the um, field, not that it is enough. We said the research is not done. It is not systematic yet, but we found an opportunity for two reasons with the commercial populations, uh, population. First is that it is understudied. Okay, so we have much on Medicare and Medicaid less on the commercial population. Second, research has also shown that it is possible that there might be some stigma or perhaps more reluctance to um, even disclose anything in the commercial population because of fear of losing, remember, commercial is the employed population. So there might be a fear of losing one's job or perhaps being ostracized in the workplace there are many different issues. Now, arguably, we will not get all of these from data, but we are confining our population to our study population to the commercial population as a start. Second, uh, of course, we don't know much about the risk profile. And finally, uh, the commercial population is about two thirds of the insured population. So uh, next slide, please. So who is it in our sample? The study sample, uh, we selected everybody about the age of 18 who is enrolled in a commercial insurance plan. We excluded those with a cancer diagnosis just because uh, the um, underpinnings of cancer treatment involve many other factors that we were not able to control for in this analysis. And we wanted also naive users so that we can test this, these models on a population that may not bring too much baggage from drug-drug uh, interactions or perhaps longer terms of exposure. So uh, everybody had to have their first prescription in our data. Uh, we excluded also people receiving hospice care, of course. Uh, next, please. Uh, also for those of you who are uh, building such studies, we always try to get a benchmark so a starting point for everybody in the data set that is on an equal footing, not the same date, but equal footing. So for all of these naive opioid users, uh, we selected an index date. And at that point, we also looked at the different, um, we look at the covariates, but the outcome of the interest here for the purpose of this presentation is opioid overdose. Next, please. I mentioned the different covariates that we wanted to look at. Uh, and these are sociodemographics. There are types of insurance coverage, PPO, HMO, et cetera. The type of insurance plan, different comorbidities that we thought could be impacting the outcome. Uh, we looked at uh, the Charleston Comorbidity Index as a measure of comorbidity burden, mental health conditions and different procedures and we will show you the distribution of the data along these. We also looked at the dosage of opioids along the different thresholds that the CDC has, the 50 and the 90 uh, MME. Next, please. And the approach, as I mentioned, was really the intent is to compare our traditional method to the machine learning method. Uh, I would like now to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Oates, so that um, he can give us a good perspective on the use of machine learning and AI. And then, uh, we'll, then uh, Dr. Pradhan will discuss the results. And then we'll circle back. I'll come back at the end to uh, draw conclusions and open it up to discussion. Dr. Oates. So um, what is machine learning? So we're making this distinction between uh, traditional statistical methods and machine learning. 
In fact, the boundary between them is pretty fuzzy and it depends on your uh, domain of origin where you draw that line. But in general, the machine learning is just the study of building computer programs that get better at some task with experience. And in most circumstances, that experience is just more data. At a very high level, there are three different kinds of machine learning problems. Uh, there are many more refinements of these, but one is supervised learning. And that's the kind that we're doing in this particular case. So in supervised learning, you have things, and the example shown here is emails, and they're labeled by type. So someone has come along and said, this is an important email. This is not necessarily an important email. And given that data set of things labeled by type, your task is to learn a function that can take a new thing and tell you what the likely type of that is. In our application, the things are patients with their patient data, and we're trying to predict whether there's going to be an overdose event or not. In unsupervised learning, as shown in the upper right-hand side, you just have things. You don't have anyone telling you what the type is, and you're trying to find groupings of them. So you can think about patients, and I've defined some measure of similarity among patients, and I'm just looking for groupings of the patients that are internally coherent and similar to one another, but different from the patients in the other categories. And then finally, there's reinforcement learning, which is very different, um, but has seen a, an amazing resurgence these days. And in reinforcement learning, you think about that you're an agent of some kind embedded in an environment. So here we've got mice. Uh, the mouse can enter a maze. They get a visual feedback about what they're seeing of the maze right now. Maybe there's olfactory information about where the cheese is. And given that information on a moment by moment basis, they're making decisions about what action to take. Should I go forward? Should I turn left or right? But again, for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna be focusing on supervised learning. So next slide. And machine learning has very broad applicability. So you can, and I'm sure that many of you have seen news reports about some of these applications, but um, you can apply supervised learning to do fraud detection in financial transactions. So here's the set of transactions, they're fraudulent. Here's another set, they're not. You can also use machine learning methods to say, show me financial transactions that seem unusual in some way. Every time you talk to um, a smart home device like Alexa or Siri, uh, the speech recognition systems in there are trained up using machine learning methods. I'm currently working on a project um, applying supervised learning to find and measure plaques and carotid ultrasound images. And um, one of the recent great successes, if you're in the machine learning field, is um, uh, Google produced a program called AlphaGo, which learned to play world-class Go and beat the best human players in the world. And Go is a game that has resisted attempts by machine learning and AI for decades now. And that one has finally succumbed. So, you know, why machine learning? Why not just stick with tried and true models like logistic regression? One is that it, it opens up the space to very powerful and flexible models. So we have different models that might be more or less well suited for the application domain. Given that flexibility, modern machine learning models also make it easy to integrate domain knowledge in a variety of ways. So if you know something about the domain, you can constrain the model in ways that make it uh, more efficient with respect to the amount of data that you need. Also for these models, more data typically means a better prediction. So you're in this happy situation where if you just have more data, you throw it at the model and things should hopefully get better. And then a lot of work in machine learning these days has been focused on trying to analyze the models themselves to understand something about the domain. And we've done some work along those lines that we'll be talking about in a bit. So next slide. There are um, a variety of algorithms that we've looked at. Two of the main ones are called support vector machines and another is random forest. So uh, logistic regression, which we've mentioned before, takes a set of points, a set of patients and tries to divide them into two pieces. Um, logistic regression, it turns out, divides them linearly. So you can think about putting a plane in space and everybody on this side is gonna have an overdose event and everybody on the other side's not. Support vector machines of the form that we've used are also linear separators, but they have a unique function um, that, that determines what a good separator is and an SVM can find the optimal such separator. So, and it can do that fairly efficiently. So SVMs often perform better than models like logistic regression. We've also used random forests, which are collections or ensembles of decision trees 
for decision trees or learn to do that, solve that classification task in a supervised setting. But the random forest builds many trees that have different views of the data and they vote with one another. And both of these methods have very um, easy ways of saying, now that I've learned either an SVM or a random forest, how do I find the high impact features? Uh, we looked at a variety of other algorithms. So applying lasso, uh, which is a method for regularizing or keeping a variety of kinds of models from overfitting the data. Random forest we already talked about, support vector machines is another. Um, GBM or gradient boost machine is another one of these ensemble methods that takes a collection of base level classifiers and combines their predictions to make them um, typically more effective. And we'll see that actually the GBM worked quite well later on. And then there are deep neural networks, which again, have gotten a lot of play in the popular press recently. So we applied a deep neural network to solve this problem as well. So um, the, the random forest, the GBM, the deep neural network are all nonlinear machine learning methods. The SVM and logistic regression as we've used them are linear. So next slide. Okay, and we were very careful in this effort to make sure that we're um, evaluating in a sound way. Uh, we divide the data between uh, training and testing. So we'll have some data that we use to build the models, another set of data, which was never seen by the models for testing. We do stratified sampling to ensure that the class proportions are the same in training and testing. Because in this data set, the, um, the number of overdoses is very small in comparison to the rest of the data set. So we commonly use tenfold cross-validation, which is just a method for ensuring that all the data is used for both training and testing um, and uh, gives you more fine-tuned estimates of, of the accuracy of the model and used a few different evaluation metrics. So precision, which is just how accurate is the model when it says, I believe that person's gonna have an overdose and recall, which is of all the people that have overdoses, how many of them are we able to find? And then F1 is a combination of those two because precision and recall tend to pull the model in opposite directions. Then you can also look at um, various versions of area under the curve. So all these models have the ability to set a threshold. So how certain are you that that person is gonna have an overdose and you can raise or lower that threshold. And as you do that, you sweep out different values for precision and recall. So we looked at the area under the curve um, for the PR curve, and then also looked at the area under the curve for a thing called the receiver operating characteristic, which looks at the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. Larger values for that tell you that your model is robust over a large range of settings of that parameter. Let us now take a look at the results. Uh, just to reiterate, the objective of our study was to predict overdose events in patients who are exposed to prescription opioids. The study population was identified using NDC codes for opioids, and we excluded opioid prescriptions for cough and cold medications. Uh, as Dr. Shaya mentioned earlier, the first date for receiving an opioid prescription was set as an index date. There were more than 3 million patients who had a prescription for opioid at the outset. And after applying our exclusion criteria for age, having a cancer diagnosis, being in hospice care, or having an overdose or OUD diagnosis prior to their first claim for prescription opioids in our study uh, period, the final analytical uh, sample came down to 927,395 patients. Out of these patients, 66,959 patients had a diagnosis for opioid use disorder. Now, opioid use disorder here is an important prescription opioid-related adverse outcome, and hence we wanted to flag it separately. We defined an OUD event as the presence of a diagnosis for opioid dependence, abuse, poisoning, or treatment for an OUD following their first prescription. Considering that not everyone in this population will receive a diagnosis code for OUD, we used a proxy outcome as well using procedure codes related to treatment of OUD and more generally for drug rehabilitation and detoxification. We also defined a final any outcome as essentially a union of the diagnosis codes or, and the treatment codes to capture as broad a population of individuals with opioid use disorder as possible. Because like Dr. Shaya and Dr. Oates mentioned earlier, the prevalence of these conditions is 
quite low in our population. We identified these claims after the first index prescription using the International Classification of Disease 9th Revision or the CPT, so the ICD codes, the current procedural terminology or the CPT codes, and the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System or the HCPCS codes. Now, the ICD-10 system of uh, disease identification did not go into effect almost until uh, October of 2015. And since our study sample only ended at uh, September 2015, we did not uh, use ICD-10 for identifying any of our disorders. Now, coming to our main outcome of interest, out of the total study population, only 6,091 patients had a diagnosis for overdose. We flagged occurrence of fatal or non-fatal uh, opioid overdose using diagnosis scores from outpatient, inpatient, and emergency department settings. Similar to OUD, we identified claims after the first index prescription using the ICD-9, CPT, and HCPCS scoring systems. We now look at the distribution of some of the demographic characters that Dr. Shaya mentioned earlier. Uh, all of our demographic variables were identified at the time of their first index, at the time of the index date or the first prescription for opioid. The graph here on the left looks at the distribution of age in our particular population. And as you can see, majority of individuals who had a prescription for opioid were aged 55 years and older, and more than 50% of this entire population was aged 44 years and older. The second graph on the right uh, shows the sex distribution in our particular population. As you can see, nearly 60% of the study population were females. The distribution of age and sex in our cohort was found to be comparable to a different commercial population, which also looked at a similar cohort of patients. This just enables us to uh, ascertain that our dis distribution of demographic, common demographic variables is comparable and it improves the generalizability of our findings to a level. Our next graph here looks at the regional distribution or the geographical distribution of patients across the country. As seen in this pie chart, the location of residence for majority of our patients in our population was the southern region, with nearly 35% of our population living here. And this was closely followed by the Midwest region. Now, the pie chart on the right shows the type of insurance coverage that our patients were enrolled in at the time of their index claim. As is visible, majority of our study population, that is nearly 72%, had a preferred provider organization-based insurance plan, while only 0.5% had a consumer-directed healthcare plan. Now, this is important because we are using these types of insurance coverage as a proxy indicator for access to healthcare. Because essentially what these insurance plans tells us is uh, what kind of access to healthcare do, do these patients have? And it also impacts their total costs that are incurred at the time of treatment. Similar to our demographic variables, we also flagged the comorbidities in our study at the time of the index prescription. We flagged patients for hip replacements, joint replacements, and other jo joint replacements, which essentially included the upper and the lower extremity joint replacement surgeries. Uh, the reason why we flagged hip and knee separately were primarily because those are the most prevalent joint replacement uh, surgeries that occur in the United States. It was observed that nearly 1% of our study population had undergone a joint replacement surgery. Now, considering the association between mental health and substance abuse, we also flagged seven specific mental health conditions that were known to be associated with prescription opioid abuse or misuse. These included alcohol dependence, anxiety, ADHD, bipolar disorder, psychosis and schizophrenia, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. 
it was seen that nearly 4% of our entire population had some mental health condition or the other. As we indicated earlier, we flagged comorbidities identified by the Charlson's Comorbidity Index and calculated a comorbidity score. It was observed that 88% of the total population did not have any comorbidity as was flagged by the CCI. Approximately 11% had one to two comorbidities and 1% 1 had more than two, com more than two com comorbidities, sorry. Based on the degree of severity, the CCI score calculated was then divided into three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. Having a CCI score of one to two was included in the mild category. Having a score of three to four was included in the moderate category. And having a score of greater than or equal to five was included in the uh, severe category. Now, as you see on the table on the right, Almost 9.86% of our total population fell in the mild category. Uh, nearly 1% had a moderate severity of comorbidities, whereas less than 1% fell in the more severe type of comorbidity burden. Of all the conditions that were flagged, we found that chronic pulmonary disease and diabetes without complications were the two most prevalent conditions, with chronic pulmonary disease uh, population prevalence being nearly 5% and diabetes without complications uh, being having a prevalence of nearly 4% in our study population. We then developed simple and adjusted logistic regression models. We adjusted these models for age, sex, region, insurance type, drug classes such as benzodiazepines, muscle relaxants, stimulants, uh, the daily dose of opioids, the duration of treatment with prescription opioids, and the comorbidities. In this slide, we are presenting results for the adjusted models that was significant at a p statistically significant at a p value of less than 0 0.05 so our models here essentially show that having a location of residence in the northeast having a prescription for benzodiazepine having an opioid daily dose of greater than 90 morphine milligram equivalents having a long term prescription for opioids that is a prescription for opioid of greater than 90 days and having a mental health condition were all associated with significantly increased odds of having an overdose event. As you can see here, long-term uh, use of opioid was associated with almost 34 times greater odds of having an overdose event, while having a mental health condition increased the odds of someone having an overdose event almost seven times. On the other hand, it was observed that being middle-aged, that is uh, being between the in the age group of 35 to 44 years was associated with a 35% decrease in the odds of having an overdose event. And similarly, residing in the Southern region was associated with a 25% decrease in the odds of having an overdose event. The models, this slide essentially shows selected results from our models that were adjusted for comorbidities that were significant at a p-value of less than 0.05. Our models that adjusted for comorbidities showed that having an opioid use disorder diagnosis exponentially increased the odds of someone having an overdose event. This is important because it essentially reiterates and highlights the fact that there is an increased need for surveillance and monitoring in this particular population. We can also see that uh, having a CCI score of three to four, which essentially represents moderate severity of comorbidity, uh, was also associated with higher odds, almost six times higher odds, having dementia ha and having undergone joint replacements, having mild liver disease were also all associated with greater odds. Now, the main objective of our, our project here was to compare these machine learning based methodologies with logistic regression models and help identify the best method to predict overdose events. 
Additionally, we also wanted to identify what are those high impact parameters that are driving these overdose or that would help us identify these particular patients. So for this purpose, we developed a, a support vector machine and a random forest model, and we use them for feature selection. Uh, for the, both these models had a very high accuracy of almost 99%. And out of the 25 top high impact parameters that were identified by each of these models, there was almost a 40% concordance between their feature selection process. Now, what this means is that out of the 25 parameters that were identified, there were the same, temp same 10 parameters that both these models identified. However, because of the way that these models identify these high impact parameters and the way they assign weights to these particular parameters, the ranking was different in both these cases. Now in this result, uh, in this table, we are only showing you the top five parameters. And as you can see, the date of overdose diagnosis and the date of having an OUD diagnosis were both parameters, were uh, parameters that both our models identified. Uh, now, Dr. Oates will be going over the performance of each of our machine learning models. So this table shows for the, the method in the left-hand column, uh, the F1 scores, the area under the precision recall curve, and the area under the rock or the receiver operating characteristic curve. So a few things I think are worth noting here. Um, the, the F1, if you'll recall, is um, it's a combination of precision and recall. It's actually precision times recall divided by precision plus recall, that whole thing times two. So it's bounded to be between zero and one. Um, note that logistic regression has the lowest F score. Um, of the other models, uh, the deep neural network and the support vector machine, remember the, the, the DNN is nonlinear, the SVM is a particular kind of linear model have F1 scores that are about 0.9. What that means is that the precision and recall for both of those cases are, are quite high. Um, but the, the GBM and the random forest, yep, the GBM and the random forest, uh, both had significantly higher uh, F1 scores um, and they both are actually ensemble methods. So that suggests that um, a single model is perhaps not the appropriate way to go here, but um, the, the ensembles are gonna perform better. You can see that the precision recall areas under the curves are kind of tracking with the, the F1 score, which makes sense. And the AUC values are significantly higher in all cases. Um, the area under the precision recall curve can be between zero and one. The AUC minimum value is a half, so it's limited to be between 0.5 and one. So those values tend to get pushed up a little bit higher. Um, so next slide. So I'll just start off talking about a, a few conclusions and then I'll, I'll hand it back over to my colleagues. Uh, one is that there is this sort of constant tension between precision and recall. As we saw in the previous slide, the ensemble methods seem to work best in this particular case. And again, note that it's a highly class imbalanced case and that the higher capacity models, that is the models that have more free parameters that are able to tune themselves to the model in more interesting ways um, tend to outperform logistic regression. And uh, I would add to this and wrap it up and open it up to questions. Uh, to complete this, I just want to point your attention to the origin of the data. So there was a question, and we'll address that in Q&A, uh, about the small sample size, the uh, wide inter confidence intervals. Um, yes, the sample size is relatively smaller than what we would like in uh, large data sets uh, applying AI and ML methods. Uh, here, it was really to compare the methods among AI, ML, and then compare them to logistics. We'll cover that. But also, I want to bring to your attention the nature and the origin of the data. AI and ML will always amplify any signal in the data. So if there's any missingness or any uh, wrong coding, or perhaps the selection of the data is more biased because of convenience sample or uh, you know, referral bias or any of the potential sources of bias that you know from your epidemiological uh, training. Um, 
we will need to pay attention to that and at the very least understand it because when we train those models, they can only be trained on the data that they see. And so um, there has been a big parallel uh, area of research emerging about um, paying attention to potential uh, conclusions that might leave out completely certain populations because of uh, the skewness of the data. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is the translational part. Now that we develop the models, uh, hopefully with larger data and more current data, we are really looking at impacting practice and informing um, public health practice and clinical practice. And with the amount of data coming to us, certainly about COVID, we want to really make sure that we have the methods lined up so that we can go into those data, whether they are COVID data or uh, any public health problem or here opioids and make sure that we have a good method and a good plan for analyzing that data because those results are going to be implemented in public policy and in practice guidelines. So we all have a shared responsibility. And with that, I will end that it is not one discipline, uh, but it is imperative that we have multidisciplinary teams. And this is how we can keep one another honest and result uh, and come out with a solution that makes sense in the field. And with that, I will just wrap up. What we did is that we identified the problem. We justified or said, explained why we are addressing this issue and why we went after that data, explained what the data looked like, and then showed you some ways that we could analyze the data again to look at the over, uh, overdose result uh, by applying those different methods. And with that, I think, we, I think we can complete our presentation. I want to thank you and I'll give it uh, back to Dr. Lehman. So thank you, that was terrific. And, uh, and as, as the panelists pointed out, this is a really great soup to nuts uh, uh, study, showing you the problem and giving the methods. Um, so uh, we do have some questions in Q&A, and uh, why don't we go through them. Um, uh, so Rob, uh, I think is about 12 hours uh, in a different time zone, uh, asked the issue about small sample size, and, and specifically how did the SVM handle the combination of smaller sample size and error, and how was that handling quantified? I can respond to that briefly. Um, so, I mean, I'm slightly curious why you focused on the support vector machine. <laughs> Maybe that's too hard to go back and forth on, but um, SVMs in particular are, due to the nature of the optimization function, uh, are quite good in dealing with small sample sizes. So um, they learned what's called a max margin classifier. So they try and find a separator that sits as far as possible from the sort of two bodies of data that are there. Um, so perhaps not surprising that a linear SVM was able to do uh, relatively well. I would say that we, you know, the quantification of the error just had to do with computing um, tenfold cross-validation scores. We have means and variances for those that were not presented in this presentation, but it's also the case that the fact that the areas under the various curves were relatively high means that those models are generalizing well over a relatively large range of thresholds applied to um, applied to the decision function. So hopefully that helps. Uh, Leonardo Gonzalez asks, what network architecture did you use for the deep neural network? I could take a stab at that too. Um, so uh, it was um, sort of old school uh, in the sense that um, we used a multi-layer perceptron that is you just have the input values. There weren't that many variables. They get handed to a couple of layers of hidden nodes that are all fully connected. Um, and then you've got a binary output, which was trained up with a cross entropy law. So um, it's, it's not too deep, but it was, uh, I think, deep enough to form good internal representations of this data set. Uh, talking about old school, John, Jordan from Texas asks, uh, the data went back to 2007. So do you, do you see changes over time? Did you look for changes over time? Would, would any of these methods do a better job of such secular trends? 
What I can say about the uh, data, it is all data. What we have found, uh, well, this is the data that we have for this project. However, we have also looked at more recent data in Medicaid, Medicare. Certainly one of the possibly issues that we have with the older data is that the uh, outcome was relatively rare. More recent data possibly would have a higher prevalence of the outcome uh, and possibly longer follow-up as well. We use this data set for practice and uh, for, again, it was part of our pilot study so that we could actually uh, apply those two methods and compare them. So the actual results matter less than the process by which we went. And that was the idea because we would not come to a, uh, probably to a seminar to uh, present results that are old. The results that we do present are the comparisons. Now, to your point, if the outcome had been more prevalent, perhaps the comparison would have taken another uh, route. Uh, I might also ask uh, one of my colleagues possibly to opine on this. I do also want to address, since, you're, since we're talking about the data, uh, the choice of the overdose event. Perhaps it was not clear in the explanation, but we did look at the opioid event after the index date. So the other uh, sociodemographics were uh, captured around the index date, but anything that's related to the outcome clearly was after the index date. So just to clarify that. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, Tim, was there, uh, perhaps, I mean, it might be worth discussing whether our comparison, which is our goal, whether the comparison would have been affected if the process would have been affected had the outcome been uh, higher, uh, you know, more prevalent, because it is relatively rare in our case. Right. So, um, I mean, it, it's an interesting question about uh, the fact that the rate of opioid issues has been increasing through time. Um, it There are two ways in which that could impact the data. One is just that it could become more prevalent, as you said, as we go through time. Um, the other is that there might be some factors in the data um, that make it more likely that, that, that the situation is changing on the ground, right? So there are certain factors that indicate that you're more likely to get an overdose given the way the circumstances have changed, that people are prescribing them more frequently. So we didn't go to that level of granularity. Um, I do think that it might be interesting to look at the prevalence through time we could also imagine trying to learn models for sort of the, the first half of the data and the second half of the data in time, or to look and see if there are cut points that you could identify where um, the features that are important change. And that might tell you something about what happened in the underlying domain. Um, so it, it, I think it's an interesting area to look into. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to ask folks who I, we can't get to your questions to do, email the, the speakers directly. Uh, you're asking some really great questions. And I think the, the socioeconomic status question is, is really huge. And you talked to Shai about the, uh, Fadia, but you talked about the, um, the process. Is there some way of articulating the process that would be able to see how your population does or does not match other populations where people are concerned about this so that they don't go about, so once you're done, whether or not, you're gonna have some model at the end of it, but the model, it's not just as only as good as the data that goes into it, but it's only, only appropriate in some ways for a comparable population. Can you say something about what you think, how you think your population is or is not different from the populations of potential application of this model so people don't do something stupid. Absolutely. So uh, it is very important to not only understand the population, but also in the um, conclusions or the implications, especially that this goes to practice, that uh, the results are interpreted and constantly make sure that they are interpreted in the context of that population. This population is the commercial population who has remained in the commercial plan. So there might be uh, opportunities to look at the flow of entrants and those who leave that population and see, is there selective attrition? Are people leaving 
I mean, clearly we know that a commercial population for risk factor or, and all other determinants that impact outcomes is very different from Medicare or Medicaid. That's clear. However, even within the commercial population, is there any uh, movement that is contingent on the outcome that we're looking at and that is actually shaping the population, especially when it comes to opioid use disorder or, well, overdose is the outcome, but of opioid use disorder, there might be potentially a selective attrition that people lose a job because of a severe condition. So we would not even be uh, looking at that. And that might be uh, underestimating our outcome. Uh, there might also be, if there are only new entrants, uh, we might not have a long enough follow-up period for them to be capturing that uh, outcome. And that's important to understand the, even as we develop those scores, to understand at the clinical, um, you know, or the decision point, what type of profile we're dealing with. And at the end of the day, as you mentioned about the social, social determinants, we did have in parallel, we do have a, an ongoing study now that is looking at the at indices of social and economic and educational um, factors that and how they interact with health behavior and health outcomes. And it's not only the social deprivation index, which is very important, but it is also about neighborhood effects or perhaps um, a type of demographics of other people in your surroundings. So not only your demographic, very quick note I will talk about. We were looking at trends of COVID prevalence and based on socio-demographics. And uh, what we saw from data is that if in your region, there is a higher proportion of people of Medicare age or Medicare patients, then uh, there is a lower prevalence of COVID. This would not have been necessarily patient-based, but these are determinants that might somehow affect the risk profile. And I think we need to move toward that to understand not only at the individual level, but the surrounding level and how that might affect outcomes. Uh, we still need to do a lot of work in this. Our time is up. The music may be queuing in in a second. I just want to thank you for an incredible example of how uh, not just it, opioids it's themselves is a complicated uh, environment. And again, the, all the things you have to think about in both creating a model and then thinking about how it, it will be used in the future, which is the, uh, John and others uh, pointed out as a question. So again, let's thank our speakers uh, uh, for a great talk. Uh, folks who we couldn't get to your questions, please send them. We will be posting uh, the, the, the recording to our website and we look forward to seeing you at a future date. Um, uh, so thank you very much and uh, have a great day. Thank you, thank you all. Yep, thanks. Thank you, everyone.